Okay, at this time, we're going to bring up our first company for the gaming and entertainment category. Big Five Games from South Africa. Hey, TechCrunch, the entertainment has arrived. Hit the clicker. Clicker. Good. Growing up in Zimbabwe, pre-internet and pre-mobile phones was as about as remote and as disconnected as you could get. <laughs> Our lives changed forever when I was 10 years old. Our parents gave us a gift that transformed our understanding of the world, a rare, coveted Atari game console. <laughs> <laughs> yes. These games introduced us to imaginary worlds we never knew existed or could be dreamt up. And this led us into careers in technology and gaming. Computer games are engaging, educational, and loads of fun, and now easier to play than ever before across consoles, PCs, tablets, and mobile phones, almost everywhere, but not yet here in Africa. With over 600 million mobile phone users, this should be a hotbed of gaming. But most games are not data optimized for markets like Africa, where the cost of data can be prohibitively expensive. International games often lack a connection and relevance to an African audience who need and deserve their own characters and themes. We're opening up the African market to gaming with Big Five Games, a gamification platform for Africa. Big Five Games delivers easy-to-play, data-optimized mobile games relevant to the African market. We gamify sports, esports, entertainment, stocks, and farming through Fantasy League and prediction games. These are not video games, this is a whole new ball game. Let's switch to the demo and show you what this looks like. Switch to demo. So we're gonna start with our back end and just show you how we create a game. So we take inputs like player profiles, events, logos. We load this into our database. A game template is then selected and then scoring models are updated. Once published, the end user experience looks like this. We've had over 22,000 people play our games on partner sites like Quesa ESPN. This is a game we actually did for the NBA Africa game that took place in Johannesburg in August. Users log in with their Facebook or Google profiles, converting from anonymous into registered users. It's important to note this is not a native app. This is mobile web, no, no app to download. The, the games are skill-based with players scoring points for their selections. So if I have a player that scores points on the court, I score points in the game. I can see player information and stats. And the platform also has a feature phone option designed for low bandwidth browsers like Opera Mini. Now let's look at a completely different game, Big Five Stocks, a stock market game for Africa. I'm presented with the same game template and a similar user experience. But instead of selecting basketball players, I'm selecting five stocks or five global markets, with African markets being one of the one of the categories here. And instead of seeing player profiles and stats, I get to see stock market information and charts. Let's switch back to the presentation, please. So how do we make money? For consumers, our games are free to play with in-game purchases to come. Our partners license our games and pay us a licensing fee. We provide a turnkey white label solution, so the licensing fee is based on the complexity and duration of the game. In addition to licensing, we also have agreements in place for revenue share partnerships. We have an incredible distribution partner in Quese, who is the official African partner for Netflix and Roku. And Quese Sports has licensed broadcast rights to the leading sports events around the world. We work with Quese Sports to create games for ESPN Africa and the NBA. And they differentiate our games through their exclusive content and data rights, delivering news, scores, and live broadcast content wrapped around the game experience. To engage with consumers, brands invest in sponsorships of sports and entertainment, and they can choose to activate that, that sponsorship in multiple ways. So we are competing for that spend. They could go with traditional means of TV ads, radio ads, or billboards. Our data proves that we provide a much more effective alternative approach. We, we provide for an engaged user base we create a database for users, and we also provide valuable and unique insights and demographics not available through traditional media. Once brands decide to go with games, they could work with global games providers. 
But these providers are often costly and not built for emerging markets, especially with low smartphone penetration. Unlike the competition, we are cost-effective, localized, and truly built for, for, for mobile. Our initial growth and target market is in these five African countries with a combined population of 380 million people. The, the market spend in these countries on ads and gaming is already $5 billion a year. And we intend scaling into this market by partnering with telcos and content providers to reach their audiences who are eager to game. Big Five Games is creating a new generation of African gamers, and we're recruiting partners to launch games and engage with consumers in fun and relevant ways. Join us as we gamify Africa. Start building and playing games on our platform today at big5games.com forward slash battlefield. Thank you. I like, I like your characters. Do they have names? <laughs> no? Yes. All right. <laughs> Judges, go ahead. Do you have any questions? Yes. So oh, what is your core way of making revenue? How do you scale your revenue? Is it a mix and will always stay a mix? Are you looking to build your own games, monetize them yourselves? What is it that, that, that you're going for here? We, we, we've tested some of our own games, but our go-to-market strategy is to partner with big brands and big organizations that have a large audience and try and utilize that as a distribution channel to get to that audience. We, we have designed the platform to allow us to do uh, multiple game types. So we mentioned sports or esports or entertainment. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is that the platform allows us to truly look at Africa with 54 countries and localize for every country. So we could drop a football game in for the Kenyan Premier League or the Nigerian Premier League or the South African Premier League. And we're going to be talking to those organizations and have existing conversations with some of them already about trying to bring games to their audience and get an engaged audience and give them valuable and unique insights. The insights are particularly important because it tells the organization who the fan favorites are, what the selections are, who they're playing with, and that's absolutely critical to these organizations, particularly when it comes to promotion of players and merchandising sort of activities. And just a follow-up maybe on this, um, who owns the, the game then itself, specifically if you co-brand? And do you go out and monetize it through advertisement, or is it the partners that go out and, and find the advertisers with their existing networks? We own the games. The games are, are licensed and we've, we've developed the games. Mm -hmm. But the partner does go out to attract that audience and spend into that audience. Mm -hmm. So Quezzi, as an example, in one of our games has provided 5,000 US dollars in cash prizes to attract entrance into that competition. And, and monetization in terms of advertisers coming on those uh, games to, to spend their money to reach this audience? Is it you going out or the partners? It's the partner going out. There is advertising space within the games and the partners can monetize that. And can you talk a little bit about um, you know, a particular game and how many users are there typically on? You know, what's the attraction? Yeah. And also, how do users, the end users, of, you know, actually perceive these games in the context? So every game is, is different depending on what the game is and where the audience is. A football game that we launched for the English Football League um, attracted 4,000 people in month one. We added 6,000 people in, in month two. So they are growing and they are starting to get users on board. Um, as far as retention goes, it's about a 30 to 35% retention of people playing the games on a week-by-week -week basis. And we are seeing cross-pollination across those games. We're finding the interest points. So someone that's playing a football game might be interested in playing the stock market game or one of our entertainment games. But from your revenue model, just as a follow-up question, um, that penetration is still good enough for attracting big brands to work with you? Yes, absolutely. The, the conversations we have with big brands, the most important thing for them is gamification. To engage with customers in a completely new way around games. And then we work with the partner to find out what the right game is. With Quezay Sports, as an example, sports is their domain, and that's their focus area. So our go-to-market strategy with them was to launch sports games. Our stock market game, we would look for a financial services organization that's operating across <laughs> Africa to do an Africa-wide game. Or we could localize specifically and go into Nigeria or Kenya and find an organization that's just focused there and wants to do a game only with Kenyan stocks or only with Nigerian stocks. Um, you said 600 million phone users, and when we're talking about the business-to-consumer model, um, you're saying that it's free for these users. It is, yes. Are you planning on integrating any revenue model that upgrades them where there are fees charged? Or? Yes. 
We are planning on launching our own in-game currency and, and points that people earn for playing in the game. In, in Africa, monetizing an audience can be quite difficult, and that's why our, our go-to-market strategy has been working with big brands, but also to look at telcos, because integrating to carrier billing is one of the best ways to monetize an audience. So as we build the games and have the right partners and we have the right audience, we can start introducing in-game currency and advance packages that people buy within the games. Any other questions? <clears throat> Have you had any um, any pushback from any regulatory organizations, anyone that's looking at this and saying, hey, you're actually crossing into a betting line? Has any ha has it happened to date? No, it hasn't. We, we've, we've looked extensively across the African continent. We're not betting because it's a free-to-enter game. We're not lotteries because someone isn't buying a token to enter the game. So because of that nature, the games don't uh, cross any sort of uh, legislation that, that would be detrimental to our business. Okay. And as you pointed out, around working with other organizations in the betting or gambling space, we would look to work with organizations that have the right licenses, and we can leverage that into market. Great. Before you go, what, what are the names of the animals? Leo. <laughs> Leo. Very good. <laughs> we'll give them a round of applause. Thank you. Next up, we're going to bring up Tango TV from Tanzania. Was it all? There are few markets where Hollywood ranks second to local content. Africa is one of them. In fact, while Hollywood Hands about 28 million in Africa, Nollywood, just Nollywood, is worth over three billion dollars. Local content is huge in Africa. Africans prefer local films and local shows uh, to any international content. So in a typical East African household, a local show like Sidi, for instance, is way more popular than even Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, I live there. <laughs> Yet, uh, the distribution of content is broken across Africa. So the current uh, antiquated DVD distribution model is plagued by piracy, leaving content creators uh, without an easy means to, uh, to monetize their content, and audiences uh, without an easy means uh, to access the content that they love. But not anymore. Introducing Tango TV. So Tango TV, is a media streaming and video on demand service for African local content. Uh, we are starting with Swahili, the most spoken language in Africa, enabling millions of Africans to stream the content they love on demand, wherever and whenever. Our Dash streaming technology enables users to control data costs by adjusting video quality, and our soon to be partnership with a large telco will enable us to offer better data rates uh, to stream Tango TV. Uh, now let's, let's switch to the live demo uh, so we can show you how it all works. Yeah, so as soon as you have the app on the device, uh, you can uh, see instantly a lot of content that we have on our platform. So you can scroll around uh, trying to see what we have. We have different categories. We have dramas, uh, comedies. Uh, we have uh, education and animation content for the kids. And once you find what you want to see, you can just uh, tap on it. Uh, you get to this uh, little information page, deta little details about the, uh, about the show or the, the movie you want to see, and then you can just hit play. And the show uh, will stream straight to your device. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the, uh, to the live pre uh, presentation. Yeah, so we make money by charging a, a $3 monthly subscription fee, which is easily payable via uh, mobile money. And this is huge because we enable people to access content as well as easily pay for it. So we have uh, various mobile money wallets that people can use uh, to pay. So we have over 600 hours of content on the platform, and we have attracted over 6,000 downloads, uh, making over 2,500 of them into monthly active users. And our growth rate is uh, a month-over-month -month growth is at 26%. You see, international uh, streaming platforms like uh, Netflix and Showmax, they offer mostly uh, international and uh, Hollywood content. And local platforms like Iroko TV, they have mostly a focus on Nollywood content. And none of these offer 
uh, an easy mobile money based payment uh, solution and they just don't focus on the needs of the African market in general. But Tango TV, we offer our hyper localized content which is easily payable via mobile money and our robust, uh, our robust uh, network of uh, local content creators enables us to aggregate top imaging content uh, and our partnership with telcos enables us to uh, get this content to the users uh, cheaply. So please uh, download our app on, on Play Store, just, uh, just search Tango TV. And uh, for telcos looking uh, to bring uh, amazing local content to their users, just go to tangotv.co.tz forward slash battlefield. Very good. <laughs> what was the name of that show that you played? Uh, that show is called uh, City of Akitonga. It's quite popular in, in Tanzania. Fantastic. All right. Way popular than Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> got to do that again. Well, let, let's start with Chris. You, you know a thing or two about Showmax. Uh, first of all, um, we welcome all competition on the African continent, and I think what you guys, what you guys are doing is tremendous because the more, of, the more people doing it, the better for Africa, and, and we love local content. It's, what, it's our top performing, so congratulations. But my question is around that content. Do you own the rights to the content, or are you purchasing that from producers? And as a uh, a second question, you've mentioned streaming. Do you offer download capabilities too? Yeah, so uh, the first question, yeah, we actually uh, purchase licensing agreement for the content. So we, we purchase streaming rights mm -hmm. for the content for a particular period of time. And actually now we are starting to produce our own original content, working with uh, local producers. And the, question, the second question is, yes, uh, we, uh, we have the, uh, the feature to download offline, but we have uh, implemented it across because uh, most of our users have really low-end Android devices, and they started complaining about storage space. Actually, that's actually a, a resource that is very uh, scarce on low-end technos, and most of, of our users are actually on those devices. So you're then relying on streaming data at night for users to, to consume the product? Oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, streaming works uh, really well across uh, many towns, for example, in, in, in East Africa, because it streams well on 3G, uh, very well, uh, no problem, and sometimes even in 2G, but it's uh, getting a little shaky there. But 3G, which is available in most major towns and, and cities across East Africa, it works fine. Who's next? So if, if nobody has, um, so thanks very much for this. Um, I, I was wondering, um, so you said you have about 600 hours of content on the site now. You just described that uh, it's licensed content. Can you give us an idea of how much that costs for you in, in a year and how you make these economics work for you in terms of your you know, monthly subscribers? Yeah, so uh, what we did when we launched, uh, they are, the way this market is, they are individual filmmakers that make their uh, own, uh, it has maybe two or three movies, and then because it's tough to distribute via DVD, you, have, you find there is a distributor who collects all these uh, films from the individual filmmakers. So you find he has maybe 200 hours or 300 hours. So we talk to him uh, because it's easier to negotiate with him and we get the content in bulk. So, yeah, so uh, if you want to target the East African market uh, or the African market in general, you have to go mobile money. So that's, uh, that's how people uh, pay for things. So you find, uh, you find uh, people pay by mobile money, they pay for electricity, water, uh, almost everything. So mobile money is already there and uh, people know it. So if you want to capture that market, you have to do mobile money. And so we built it, uh, it works really well. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can get into technicalities of it, but it works really well. You can, as soon as you pay, you get your subscription notification instantly and you can start watching streaming instantly. So we have M-Pesa, Tigo Pesa, Airtel, uh, we get across wallets. But if those payments are mobile money, they, they're gonna be prepayments, so it's not a recurring bill. Oh yeah. How are you handling getting those customers back every month to come and pay? Yeah, so that's the challenge. Yeah, we looked into that. I think it's a regulatory issue as well because mobile money transactions have to be initiated by the owner of the account and you cannot initiate and charge him without him. Uh, you cannot initiate from the merchant. So that's a huge drawback with mobile money, but we are talking with uh, Vodacom and M-Pesa and they are working uh, to resolve that. So they, they tell us as soon as it's available uh, to test, we'll be one of the first people to, to get it so that we can start 
uh, recharging people monthly, and so we, that we can have an assurance of you know an MRR that is for for sure. So we have monthly recurring revenues. Uh, so it's stuff that you every time every month you have to uh, hit the user and remind them to resubscribe again. So that's it is a challenge. If I may, just a follow-up question. So your platform that you're using, I'm assuming you haven't. It's not a bespoke platform. You've bought an off-the-shelf solution, and you're using that, or did you develop your platform yourself? Uh, actually, we develop it ourselves. So. That's what we we actually proud of, yeah. yeah. But uh, all the pieces are like uh, you know Netflix and the usual marks. We have already discovered what's the technology, what's work well, what's not work well. Mm -hmm. So what we just like uh, most of us we do like hey let's see what Netflix are using and uh, is it working quite? Can we pilot it on inside? Yeah, it's working quite well. So who is the vendor we can use? Like where can we deploy this? Where can we deploy this? So we have like a microservices, we, which are the one like, uh, if you load the catalog of the movie, you load it from somewhere, and which when you want to start in streaming, it's streaming from somewhere, so it depends on where node you are nearby. Yeah, so we transcoding, everything is built by us. So we transcode, content delivery, uh, everything. Uh, we didn't buy anything off the shelf. We didn't have the money for that. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. There are several racing games all around the world, such as Real Racing, Need for Speed, and the Asphalt. And these games are very successful as there are 3 billion players. They are also incredibly fun. But gaming today is a but gaming today is misjudged by society as it is considered as a waste of time. So, how do you make a game that is both fun to play and provide something else? That's why we have created Gascar, a mobile racing game that promotes tourism sector. Let's have you stop right there until we get the slides up. If anybody's looking for an idea for a company, a clicker. Every <laughs> single show we have issues with the clickers. It looks like we're good to go now, right? I'm yelling no. They're okay. yelling no. You want to just keep on going? Yeah. All right, you can do it. Gascar <laughs> uh, is a free downloadable. Uh, mobile racing, but the key advantage is that it is a real reproduction of a city. We modeled every neighborhood and every street of the capital of Madagascar, and all the vehicles you can see is typical for Madagascar, such as Renault for, C for L or uh, Citroen to CV. And as in the real world, and as in the real world, uh, companies can uh, add advertisements in all the circuits, and they pay to get it. Uh, in addition, we have included in-app purchases that uh, be accessible for African countries. It is uh, typically for Africa, since uh, we, uh, thanks to Gasca, which is an um, uh, I'm sorry. It is an accessible payment system uh, via mobile banking, and it is typically for Africa. Go to demo, please. <coughs> Yes, uh, Gasca is already finished and was released six months ago. We currently have more than 50,000 users and we already have working with advertising partners. Uh, in this first version, we have uh, 
72 circuits and 28 customizable cars. So uh, you can have an online multiplayer system. Yes, go to the presentation, please. <laughs> Regarding competitors, we, in Madagascar, we are the only game developers that focuses on racing game. In Africa, there are very many successful games such as Orion, but these games are paid to download while Gascar is free to download. And at the international level, we have many and very successful uh, racing games which are uh, franchises too, such as uh, real, real Racing, Asphalt, and uh, Need for Speed. These games are very fun, but they do not provide a virtual tourism. Moreover, when making a video game, we need, uh, they need around $6 million, $6 million to make a video game, while Gascar well, we just uh, spent around $6,000 to make Gasca. Yeah. yeah. And regarding tourism, uh, there are many services like, uh, like, uh, Google, like uh, Google Space Store, uh, Google Street View, or Google Maps, but uh, they are just, uh, uh, they are not as fun as uh, playing a video game. <laughs> Regarding business model, we have two main uh, customers. The first one is the user. The user, the game is free for the user, but they can buy some contents in the game, and uh, it, uh, the, the average costs one dollar. I mean by uh, premium, premium items, some cars that they can personalize or, uh, or um, kits. Then, for the $50,000 we got, there are 10% of them who have bought some contents, and we then get $5,000 from the users. The second, uh, the second uh, customers is our companies. Companies pay to insert uh, advertisements, they pay for a visibility pack, such as uh, a logo at the start of the game, personalized vehicles, uh, billboards in all the circuits, and uh, um, special corporate game mode. In total, then, we, always, we have already working with three advertising companies, and we generated $45,000. In just, six six <laughs> in just six months, we generated $50,000. <laughs> our, our next project is next year. We are going to work with more countries, new version, new vehicles, and new cities. We plan to add five countries from Africa, five in France, and five more in Madagascar. In total, then, there will be more than $300,000 next year. And in addition, we also are going to upload it on Apple Store and Google's Play Store. Then we will get more than a million users, and 10% of them will buy content, so then we will have more than $400,000 4, next year. <laughs> Gascar is uh, uh, supported by uh, the Ministry of Tourism, and uh, it is the most downloaded and the most successful application here in Madagascar. Uh, we got more than 80 medias who uh, talk about it, such as uh, Forbes, such as uh, TV5 World or France TV Info. We plan to extend internationally and next year we will begin from Africa. And uh, more to it than that, we also are going to release a virtual, a virtual reality version because People like to feel teleported. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
explore a new world today with Lumay, download Gascar and uh, race in 3D through Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you want to promote your company through our virtual world, please contact us. Thank you. That, that, that was a damn fine job. Thank you. That was great. Thank Judges. So I was choking on the price point. How on earth are you developing content that cheaply compared to others? Micro. <laughs> Uh, workforce is cheaper, is cheaper in Madagascar. <laughs> and for user acquisition, uh, we got help from our partners uh, initially. Mm -hmm. um, has the Ministry of Tourism of Madagascar supported you at all? And are you looking for you know, relationships with other ministries in other markets to, to support the building of these projects? We've tried the project in Madagascar first, and it was once the project was already done that they approached us and contacted us, mm -hmm. and it's now that they're supporting us. And uh, Gascar's business plan uh, could work in other countries, and that's what we're looking uh, to do in other countries. Why did you make the game? I'm passionate about video games first. There wasn't any game that could uh, promote our culture and tourism in Madagascar. And because nobody has done it, uh, we didn't wait for somebody to do it, and we just did it ourselves. So the question I have then is, how many of those 50,000 players are Madagascar, and how many are none? For now, the game is only available on Gascar's website. And 90% of downloads are coming from uh, Madagascar for now. 5% from the US, and 5% is uh, the rest of the world. Can you speak a bit more to your roles? Because, uh, uh, first of all, congratulations to a great presentation. I could never do this in French. <laughs> so, fantastic. <laughs> um, but, you know, with this amazing feat of the very low cost that, uh, uh, you know, Chris is dreaming about, um, question for me, who does what in your team and, and how did you come together and so on? We, we are two co-founders, and there are 10 uh, people working for the company now. Mm -hmm. Everybody is uh, young and got uh, graduated in computer science, and, and as the co-founders, as for the co-founders, uh, we both worked for big companies uh, before. Uh, young, dynamic people uh, who've had past experience. And everybody's passionate about video games. I've just got a follow up. In terms of the, so it's free to download, and you've got people doing in app, 10% of doing some sort of in app purchase. Is that a sustainable business model on its own, or do you need to look at other revenue streams to grow? It, it's enough because they're games. It's enough because they're games without any ad, and they still manage to make enough money to be profitable.
50% of revenue comes from ads. And 50% from in-app purchases. Tell me about your funding. Did you take any venture funding from local, from African investors or local municipalities? And do you need more money? <laughs> uh, we didn't um, have any debt, so we uh, financed everything ourselves. And we had other projects on the site, such as uh, website creations, uh, mobile apps, uh, and development. <laughs> but we still need money, because if we have... <laughs> if we have more money, we can do more when we expand to other countries. Very good. Any last questions? I got 20 seconds. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. We have one more company in the gaming entertainment category, and that is Sync Commerce from Ghana. Come on out. Oh, I pulled up like this. How are you guys doing? Good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. I like just your t-shirts. Just waiting for the deck. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Me too. I'm waiting for the same thing. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> don't move, don't move. <laughs> so... You've been here for, let's talk a little bit about this process. You mm -hmm. entered in Startup Battlefield months ago, right? Right. How long ago were you accepted into it? About a month ago. Right, and then how long were you here on site? Um, we came last week Sunday. Right. Yeah. Now, I worked with you a couple times, but okay. you worked with our other team members. Tell me about what it was like working with Nisha and Samantha. Okay, so first of all, it was awesome. <laughs> All right, um, we went through our pitches, scripts, um, pitch decks and everything, make sure everything was on some point, um, every information, every aspect that we needed to cater, um, they directed and guided us in getting all of that together and get prepared for the main event, which is today. Yeah, great. Now, out of the three of us, who was the best? <laughs> it was Nisha, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah. I can see Samantha raising up her hand backstage. <laughs> but I guess I'm going to give it to Nisha because she was the one we worked with most of the time. So Nisha, Nisha, Nisha. I give it to Nisha. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great. It's, it's been a great process watching all these companies. They came, they, just like any other start of Battlefield, they apply months in advance of the event. So this one, we opened up the applications about four months ago when we closed them about two and a half months ago. And we have another event coming up, too, and we did the same thing. So we do this multiple times a year. Our next event is in Berlin, and it's the same thing. We have companies apply, and then they come in early, and we work with them. We work with them a lot, and that's great. And it's our goal to elevate this community and that they take the skills that they learn from us. So we've done this 700 times. Um, take it back and teach others and build a community. And then after they're through with the, the event, uh, we have a great community manager that links everybody together. So this is, they're not done. Our, our hope and our goal with Startup Battlefield is to create a community that these companies can interact with and learn from and help each other. And it was really neat. I'll tell you, this show was very different from the rest. It, it was different because of this location mainly. We had everybody here the entire time. So between training sessions, and there was only two of them, and then I came in later, but everybody was just hanging out in the lobby. And then everybody was helping each other with their pictures and presentations and confidence. And friendships were made, and it was just wonderful to watch. And I hope that we can recreate that going forward, because we've never had that before. So it was something special. You guys have something special here. And we're honored to be here and, and to help this community and to elevate everything. And all the judges. I hope I don't have to keep on doing this for <laughs> I have I have jokes.
Oh, I have water already. <laughs> right. Is this you guys? You I think I've seen that slide before. Oh, maybe not. Oh, okay. no, their clicker doesn't work. Just go ahead and do it, and we're going to do it in the back. Okay. You can start. Can they start it over? Oh, I need to be at the beginning. Just go. All right. So meet Nicole. Nicole's online store represents one of over 12 million online stores worldwide. Nicole is a small to medium-sized e-commerce retailer who knows that selling on more than one channel increases her sale on average by 190%. Yet, 37% of online merchants still do not sell on more than one channel, despite the huge potential lift to sales. Why? Multi-channel selling can be tedious, time-consuming, and extremely difficult to manage in real time. Online merchants, like Nicole, are faced with the burden of switching from platform to platform to manage their sales activities and keep inventory synchronized. Replicating tasks like product listings, orders and sales tracking, and inventory tracking on every single new channel. The lack of efficiency and central management across platforms makes cross-platform selling for online merchants time and capital intensive. Not anymore, introducing sync commerce the SyncCommerce centralized dashboard allows online merchants to sell, track, and manage inventory across multiple sales channels simultaneously. Sell more, work less. Let's move to the demo. And please stay with me so you can understand it. <laughs> Nicole started her own online store on Shopify and wants to extend her retail business to Etsy. She has 5,000 products and cannot list each of them manually per platform. She connects her Shopify and Etsy stores to SyncCommerce. Her Shopify data and products are automatically imported into SyncCommerce. Nicole can now select her products and send them to her new Etsy store through the SyncCommerce product page. She adds any additional information required by Etsy. This information makes her selected listings compatible to be sent to Etsy. And with the click of a button, Nicole publishes all her 5,000 products to her new Etsy store. She can track, manage, and continue to expand through the SyncCommerce dashboard in minutes, something that would have taken her days. All right, so Nicole's products are now on her Etsy store. She receives an order for three shirts on her new Etsy store. Due to the automated inventory synchronization that we provide, SyncCommerce imports that order in real time, automatically updates the inventory level of the listing on Shopify, reducing it by three, eliminating the need for any manual changes out of stock Overselling. Back to the slide, please. SyncCommerce makes effective and efficient multi channel retailing for online merchants a reality. There are other inventory management platforms in the space. Brightpell only optimizes for large businesses. Sellbright is an asynchronous tracking platform that distributes updates but does not track inbound product changes from sales channels. And Stitch Labs tracking structure is inconsistent with merchant's experience on sales channels. Unlike the competition, SyncCommerce provides affordable and optimized solution for small businesses. Real-time multi-directional syncing of product data and the ability to customize 
which products data to sync. Our monthly subscription ranges from $40 to $200 per month. The three pricing tiers are based on the number of products listed and channels connected. Over the past 24 months, our month-on-month -month growth in terms of MRR is 10% on average, with a cumulative revenue of $57,000 US dollars as our cumulative revenue across 4,000 merchants. Syncommerce targets the 63% of online merchants that sell cross-platform in North America and Europe. In the next five years, we ex uh, intend to expand to Asia and then Africa. This we expect to help us generate 80 million US dollars in revenue annually. We currently have integrations with Shopify, eBay, and Etsy. At TechCrunch Battlefield, we are excited to announce our Amazon integration. So if you're an online merchant, increase your sales by 190% and sell cross-platform. Go to syncommerceapp.com and sign up today. Thank you. Wonderful. Who here has an Etsy store? You can go first. No one? So I'd like to ask, of your 4,000 users that you currently have, are all of them seeing 190% increase in their sales? No. Um, so for the merchants who have been using SyncOMS so far, we've seen a range of 50 to 70% increment in their sales since they started using SyncOMS. But the 190% is the market um, statistics of um, um, increase in sales for merchants who sell on more than one sales channel. But they're selling on different sales channels anyway, right? So what you're doing is sort of the automation integration across different channels, right? Um, can you take that again, please? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the causality of it, right? right. So you're claiming that the sales increase because they're using sync com commerce. What I'm saying is that their sales are increasing because they're using multiple channels. Right, right. right. Um, so you're making a more arduous task simpler, but they could do it without you. They could do it but with more difficulty. What we do is to make it easy for them to, to sell on these different channels with ease. How do these customers get to know of you? Are you, you know, you, you've done integrations with Amazon, um, but are they also promoting you on their platform? Yes, so um, almost all these platforms we integrate with have app stores, okay? So merchants go there looking for solutions to the problems that they have. And this, it is through these app stores that most of our merchants have signed up um, on same commerce. Another very good um, um, source of acquisition for us has been through the customer um, support personnel of the platforms that we integrate with. Merchants go there, hey, I need this, or a solution of this sort, and then they refer them to same commerce. Just a follow-up on the question of, of sales. Can you, sure. can you speak to what's the average sales that one of your merchants that uses SynCommerce uh, has across platforms at the um, moment? It's been a range of 500 to 1,005 okay. um, for those using a per month for those using SynCommerce. But then again, there are those um, that are on the high end as well. Okay. Those merchants that are on the high end as well. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 sales per month. Mm -hmm. but Range-wise, on average, 500 to 1,005 in sales per month. And for now, they are, as I understand, they're mostly or all of them in the U.S.? Yes, about 70% of our merchants are based in the U.S., um, 10 to 15 in the Canada and U.K., the rest Europe, um, Asia. And, and where are you guys based? We're currently based in Accra, Ghana. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you manage, you know, Obviously, when you talk about customer service and right. you know, upselling from there, how do you manage this divide? You know, being, you know, being in Accra, mm -hmm. where you know, sometimes maybe the internet is not that great, um, just you know, managing customer service in the, in the States. Do you have a team there? Maybe speak a little bit to, to this. Um, it's, it's not been easy. Um, one of the reasons being that our time zones are even different. Um, the, the time that they are active there is the time that we probably should be sleeping here. So what we've employed is to get two different sets of customer um, service personnel, mm -hmm. some those who work during the daytime 
and those who work during the night time so that even those periods, we should we'll still have people available to serve our clients. Mm -hmm. You're aggregating <clears throat> the merchant catalogs, but are you consolidating the payments as well? Or do, or do I still have to go to the different merchants to do my payments and, and consolidate that as a merchant? Do you have plans to bring it all into one accounting platform as well? Um, so that would allow sort of providing so if I'm, them if a I'm checkout? Selling, I'm selling across right. multi-channels, mm -hmm. and I'm being paid in each one of those channels. Okay. Right. And I, as the merchant, now I have to go although I can manage my catalog centrally now, I'm still having to manage my payments on every individual platform. Right. Do you have plans to centralize that? Okay, so um, what we have plans for is the accounting part of it, so that merchants will know um, how much they are spending um, with their suppliers and how much they are making sales-wise and, and be able to project their profits and losses. But to go to the extent of um, um, managing the checkout process or part of the whole process, we, we don't have that in, on our timeline. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your company. How large are you? And how long have you guys been around? Um, we started in 2014. Um, we were four back then, um, currently seven. Um, we hired two uh, technical persons just about a month ago. So we have about four technical persons, um, two customer service personnel, and then me, the business person, <laughs> right? So seven in total. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, very good. Thank you very much, St. Commerce. Thank you. Judges, that is it. You are dismissed. You go backstage <laughs> and deliberate on, on the winner. Thank you. Thank you very much.